William Forrest Sherrod was born November 9th, 1919 in Belton, Texas to a barber who called him Forrest after his grandfather. But it was a Howard Payne football coach who called him Blackie, now the most famous name in Texas sports writing. Blackie first came to the public's attention in the 1950s at the old Fort Worth Press, where he gathered talent too big for a paper so small. Dan Jenkins, Bud Schrake, Gary Cartwright, Jerry Todd. Along with Blackie, they became giants in the industry. Schrake, who would write best-selling novels and author Harvey Penick's Little Red Book, once recalled his introduction to the press. It was hot as hell, he said. The ceiling fans were blowing the soot that came through the air vent. The teletype machines were clacking, and there was Blackie sitting back in the corner a cigarette hanging from his mouth. The minute I walked in, I fell totally in love. Blackie's hiring practices were unusual, to say the least. When the press needed someone to cover baseball, Jenkins recommended Todd, who'd played on a state championship team. When Todd got to the press, he asked which one was Blackie, got a running start, and did a textbook hook slide into the sports editor's desk. Blackie looked down, smiled, and said, you're hired. The young sports writers would all be shaped by their formidable boss, just as the generations of sports writers to follow. Blackie's copy made you feel like you'd stumbled into a production of Guys and Dolls on the way to the sports section. His style, much imitated, never duplicated, was concise, descriptive, brilliant. Consider a scene from a column describing a heavyweight title fight between Rocky Marciano and the unfortunate Jersey Joe Walcott, victim of a vicious Marciano punch. Blackie wrote, Walcott bent slowly to the floor, head down, as a Hindu on a prayer rug. His knees touched, and then his brow, and there he remained, like an upended slice of cantaloupe. The secret of Blackie's skill? I always thought you got to be a good reader before you can be a good writer. In his sports columns, Blackie rarely took on a cause greater than red-eye gravy or single platoon football. He'd rather make a reader laugh than cry. He'd served as a tail gunner on a torpedo plane in World War II and was shot down in the Pacific. Anything on a football field or a baseball diamond or a basketball court rarely rose to the same degree of concern. It's supposed to seem easier to write because it wasn't serious. But on November 22, 1963, the editor of the Dallas Times Herald recruited his sports editor for grave duty. All afternoon and into the night, Blackie fielded calls from reporters all over the city, forming the newspaper's narrative for the death of a president. I was looking out the window when the presidential parade, I see, I could see through a gap in the buildings. And uh, just seconds after that was, was when uh, they were shot. Just for that event, uh, they moved me to rewrite. Blackie took other assignments outside of sports. The Times-Herald sent him to Cape Canaveral for the 1969 Apollo moon landing. He prepared for duty the night before leaving by polling 14 party guests on what they most wanted to ask an astronaut. The winning question, how do they go to the bathroom? For his coverage of the moonshot, Blackie won a headliners award. He's won Texas Sports Writer of the Year a record 16 times and been honored with the Red Smith Award for career achievement. Still, he considers the Science Award in 1969 his greatest achievement. Besides writing, Blackie had other artistic pursuits. He blew trumpet for a dance band in college and played guitar until arthritis forced him to give it up. He took up painting decades ago while on vacation in New Mexico. His subjects have almost invariably been Native Americans owing to his ancestry. I always had sympathy. Uh, for the American Indians, and, and a lot of the cartoons, almost all of them, uh, have some kind of an Indian, Native American touch. 
the scenes mostly carried some social commentary. Blackie painted because it was relaxing, and he loved it, especially if he had some inspiration. He might go a year without painting in his prime. He might do three in one day. He'd make a five by seven reproduction and mail it to 40 or so friends. Ann Richards was a recipient, so was Daryl Royal. Dan Jenkins has a wall full. A few of the paintings still decorate the walls of the office in his North Dallas home, where he lives with his lovely wife, Joyce. The paintings compete with pictures of Blackie with Royal, Bud Wilkinson, even Bing Crosby. One image depicts Blackie in the Navy, shirtless and thick through the shoulders, his jet black hair rolling like the deck of a carrier. Now 93, his hair white and wispy, he still favors skinny cigarettes and shirts with epaulettes, the top two buttons standing at ease. He sleeps late and doesn't get out much anymore, but the legend remains. The name Blackie Sherrod evokes late night bull sessions, Runyon-esque prose, raucous laughter, and the gentle clink of ice cubes. The golfer Don January called him the best writer I ever read. Dan Jenkins, one of the most celebrated authors of his generation, called Blackie simply our hero. He spoke for more than just sports writers.